Very good. We're going to begin. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, on behalf of RCL Benziger, we would like to welcome you to this afternoon's feature webinar, Bite-Sized Catechesis, Tips and Tricks for Online Faith Formation. And so we are going to begin shortly. Just want to let you know, hi, my name is Nancy Bird, and I'm Director of Training and Development at RCL Benziger. And we are very, very grateful that you've taken time out of your day today. A few housekeeping tip, tips as uh, we begin our time together. We will be recording this presentation. So that's why you are on mute. So we will record it and within about 24 to 48 hours, we will send the webinar recording link out to you. Also know, along with that recording, we will send the PDF of Amy's PowerPoint. So that way you're able to relax, enjoy, and be able to use those other tools for reference. We will be, here's kind of the outline for our time together. Uh, we will have a short introduction. Amy will present for about 35 minutes. You will have a very short word from your sponsor, and then we will open it up to questions and answers. So notice on your toolbar, your Zoom toolbar, you will see the chat feature. That's one way that you can ask questions. And you also may see a Q&A feature. And that's another way that you can ask any questions during that segment of our, of our presentation. And so now, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Amy McAtee. Um, Amy has earned her MA in Theological Studies at the University of Dayton and has ministry experience in the areas of faith formation for children, for youth and adults, and, um, and has presented locally and nationally um, on the areas of catechist formation, young adult ministry, technology, and technology in ministry. Currently, she is project manor, manager for RCL Benziger, and she says a reluctant runner, but an avid reader. She lives with her husband, Patrick, in Dayton, Ohio. And again, it is my pleasure to introduce to you today's uh, a wonderful presentation um, and presenter, Amy McAtee. Amy, Amy? Thanks, Nancy. I'm so excited to be with you all today. Um, as Nancy said, I have been a, I was on diocesan staff and I was a parish DRE and I've been a catechist um, in my parish for, for ninth grade religious ed and for RCIA. And so I'm excited to be with you all today. Uh, so, my slides to advance here. So a little bit more of a detailed agenda. We're going to do a little prayer. Um, we're going to talk about some of the additional considerations for online learning. So what are some of those other factors we need to talk about? Then we'll jump into what is bite-sized catechesis and what does a session look like? I have a bunch of examples for you. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about what are some tips uh, for catechists. So if you're a DRE, you can share it with them. If you are a catechist, hopefully this will be some really practical points to kind of wrap it up for you. Uh, so as we jump into um, our time together, it's the digital call to prayer, which is get your technology ready. So the first thing that I want to say to you is you are not feeling particularly tech savvy today. It is okay to skip this part. So feel free to just watch and pray with us. You do not have to do the interactive part. Um, but if you're feeling like you want to try something new or if you are very comfortable with technology on your mobile device, you will open up a browser and go to menti. That's M-E-N-T-I dot com. Uh, it's the same on your computer that you go to menti.com in a new browser. Make sure you know how to get back to your webinar if you are not sure. Uh, and then you're going to enter the code 9917387. So I'm going to give you just a minute to do that. Open a browser if you're feeling comfortable. You're going to go to menti.com and enter 9917387. Once you enter the code, it should give you a question and I'm gonna give you the reading that you're responding to in just a minute. So, all right, giving you a minute again, just to get there to menti.com. And the code is 9917387. So our prayer today is a variation on the practice of Lexio Divina. So if there's gonna be a reading that will show on your screen, I will proclaim it aloud. 
and then you can go and respond to uh, the question that is part of that mentee survey. So, so just a minute there and we'll go ahead and get started. So taking a moment just to be mindful of um, God's presence among us, to set aside some of the busyness of the day, maybe our anxiety about online learning, and just placing ourselves in the presence of God. And we begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus went into the region of Caesarea Philippi, and he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter said in reply, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said to him in reply, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my heavenly father. The gospel of the Lord. So if you want to go ahead and use that word or phrase that has stood out to you, Give just another minute for you to observe as people are sharing those words and phrases of this rich gospel. Who do you say that I am? It looks like people are slowing down, so we're gonna go ahead and look at that next slide. So who do you say Jesus is? So we see savior, love, Son of God, living God, my Lord and God, an example, anointed, my Savior, strength and hope, teacher, brother, everything, Christ. So these responses are still coming in. I'm trying to read some of those for some of you who aren't, aren't able to see that particular screen because they're pretty tiny. Wonder counselor, everlasting life. Redeemer, I'm gonna start the countdown here to close out people's responses just to bring about the closing to this time of prayer. Lord, Emmanuel, my mentor, that's a great answer. My one certainty, how beautiful. Eternal forgiver, the Messiah. So it looks like our answers have slowed down. And so we, we bring all of this together in prayer saying, Jesus, son of the living God, you have called each one of us to this moment. To each of us, you ask, who do you say that I am? And you invite us to respond with our words, our actions, and our lives. Be with us today as we explore how we might better proclaim that you are the son of the living God. You are the Messiah. Send your Holy Spirit to open our hearts and minds. Fill us with curiosity and courage that we may be open to thinking and acting in new ways. Give us your heart that we might be filled to overflowing with love and mercy for those you have asked us to serve. And we ask all of these things in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for all of your rich and beautiful sharing. Let me switch my screen back here. 
So normally I'm someone who likes to sit with um, the previous Sunday's reading. So, so this past Sunday, this is actually part of the gospel for this upcoming Sunday. And so when I was preparing for our prayer for today, I really wanted the opportunity to use this gospel um, because this is truly the starting point of online faith formation, of all faith formation, is who do we say that Jesus is? And so uh, this quote here from the New Directory for catechesis um, just emphasizes that, that catechists are not just agents with expertise in various areas, but primarily they are persons who have experienced the love of God and for this reason alone place themselves at the service of the proclamation of the kingdom. And so as you are here to gather new skills and new ideas um, to be a catechist, this is the thing that I want you to remember first, that you are a catechist because you have experienced the love of God and you are compelled to share that love with others. And that doesn't matter if you're doing an online version, a hybrid version, if you're going to do some face-to-face, -face, um, whether your learners are five or 75, show them that you love God and invite them to consider who is Jesus in their life. So we have this tremendous opportunity um, as we're shifting ways of doing faith formation to, to help families and children and adults and godparents and grandparents to experience anew the love and mercy and compassion of the living God. And so as you prepare for online faith formation, start there. Start with, in what way can I share the love of God with others? That's your starting point. So before I move on, I do want to answer, because I know some of you are curious, the platform that I used for that online polling is a platform called Mentimeter.com. Uh, and I have used this, again, it's Mentimeter.com, and I have used this version um, of Lexio Divina, where I ask, uh, where we share and make the word cloud from the words and phrases that stand out with us. Uh, I used it a lot last year when I was a catechist for ninth grade, and they really loved it because they were a little hesitant to, to answer the question aloud, but once all of the ideas were up there, um, it led us to some really rich conversation. So it's just a variation on a traditional Lexio Divina. You can pray it through multiple times when you're doing this either online or in a group. I actually use the technology even though we were face to face. Um, and it just gives, it's really neat to, just to see that shift. It reminds us um, that scripture is living and that these experiences that we have our living. Um, so our question for today is what can I do to provide engaging catechetical sessions without overwhelming families? And this is a big question for us heading into this new formation year. And so I just want to say from the beginning that this workshop offers some tips and some tricks. Um, you'll see some different platforms and tools as we move along. I'll try to highlight those as I go. Um, one of the things that I want you to know though is that there's a lot of information and it might feel a little overwhelming. And so uh, I'm trying to to accommodate that there's, I think I just looked and I think there's like 600, 650 of you who are participating live and several people, several hundred people who will view the recording. So please know not everything that is in here is necessarily for you. So listen for where you are. Um, you will get the recording, you will get the slides, you can go back and review it again. So take a deep breath. Um, and, and, and just listen for that, which is going to be helpful for you as we move ahead. So before we jump right into uh, the process of bite-sized catechesis, let's talk about what it means to do online learning. And so when we're inviting families into an online faith formation process, whether it's completely online or if it's hybrid or supplemental, it's important to consider what do we mean by online? And I want to encourage you to think of online or digital not as a tool, but as an environment. And so our church supports this idea. This quote is from Christus Vivit, and it says, the digital environment is characteristic of the contemporary world. It is no longer merely a question of using um, of using digital tools, of using these instruments of communication, but of living in a highly digitized culture that has profound impact on ideas of time and space, of our own self-understanding, of our ability to communicate, to learn, to be informed, and to enter into relationships with others. So online 
is not just a tool, but it's a formative force of its own. And so I want you to think of this as an environment. So when we prepare our catechetical spaces for children, for families, we think about those welcoming elements. We think about what does the appearance look like and how do we get access to our spaces? And we need to also consider this as we're welcoming families and children into digital spaces as well. Our online presence is an extension of our in-person presence. And the new directory for catechesis uh, reiterates this point about digital spaces and it says catechesis cannot be carried out solely by using digital tools, but by offering spaces for experiences of faith. And so I want you to think about as you prepare a space for catechesis, what are those elements that suggest that um, we're doing faith stuff here? that we're exploring relationships with God. And so if you're learn using an online management tool like Google Classroom or Seesaw, um, they're great resources, but they, they can feel a little bit like school because they were built for schools. And especially if, you're, if your learners are also using them for school, we ne really need to be thoughtful about what are those elements that say, this is not like every other subject. This is not just learning content, but it's about exploring relationships. And so if you think about how you do that, a lot of times we do this with visual imagery. So um, my, my home office is actually our spare bedroom and we don't have any art on the walls here. But in my, my space here, I have, this is, this is Our Lady Undoer of Knots. And she's right here um, kind of by my computer. Uh, my statue of Mary that I used to have in my classroom is on the shelf beside me. So having those elements nearby um, and are incorporating them into your catechetical time is one way that you can help to evolve and to make this really feel like we do faith stuff here. And then the other thing to think about is how do we create a welcoming environment for families? You know, our families are overwhelmed. They're bogged down with new ways of doing school and work and buying groceries. And uh, maybe they're worried about their jobs or, or loved ones getting sick. There's just a lot of, of, of weight. There's a lot of weight to the world right now. And so if we want families to enter in these spaces, and this doesn't matter if they're little kids or adults, if we want them to be able to share um, life and faith in these spaces, we have to think about how we facilitate that environment. So here are some things that you can do to welcome families into online formation. And I really want to highlight this establishing relationships. So some of you do big kickoff events. And so we have to think creatively about well, what can we do if we're in a non gathered environment. Um, so what might that look like. So I know that some parishes are doing kind of drive through welcome where they have maybe some balloons and families are welcomed by staff and then they can um, give them their resources or whatever they're using for faith formation that year. Uh, it's not quite the big coffee and donuts um, celebration if with all of us together, but it still gives that excitement and that feeling. Um, perhaps if your families and your catechists are comfortable, you might do a yard visit uh, or, you know, go visit families out in an outdoor space um, where you can have a little bit of time to, to be still physically distanced, but to have an opportunity to communicate with them. Or it might just be a plain old phone call. You know, just pick up the phone and call them and, and talk with them about how are they doing. And so it's really important to, to get creative, but to really think about connecting with families and not just with the agenda of we got to get these kids re registered for religious ed, but in a sincere as a representative of your community, how are they doing um, and, and how can you pray for them. Uh, communication, another one I want to highlight here, communicate consistently, same time, same place, same way. So families should be able to predict once we get into this program year especially, how will they hear from you and what are your expectations? So we go to church to learn how to act at church. And so when we move this to online, we have to learn the expectations for behavior. Um, so if you really need that chapter review at the end of every chapter, you need to say so up front. Um, if when you're doing video chats, if your, your plan is that they have to have videos on at all times, um, you need to say so. So just being clear about what are your expectations. Uh, I, I was in a group of, of teachers who were learning how to do this. And it was interesting because one teacher put it this way. He said, online, it's easier to establish community than to maintain control. 
And I thought that was a really interesting way to put it because when, when children, especially are at their own homes, you know, we can't necessarily um, control if they get up and walk away or, you know, if they're holding the cat while they're on video. Um, but we can express communi community and expectations of behavior that are part of it. And so we can do this in a really um, dynamic way that fosters that sense of Christian community, even though we aren't physically in one another's presence. Uh, again, another one here, offering non-digital options. I am here to tell you that it is perfectly okay to give families a printed book and not just the ones that have, you know, maybe connectivity issues. So um, one of my coworkers, actually, when we were talking about in the spring, you know, she shared that her kids were doing school online and preparing for sacraments online and they were doing like piano lessons or some extracurriculars online and they were visiting with their families online and that they really needed a non-digital option. And so, so it's great to give families that option, even if they're, even if you're not doing face to face, um, to give them a way to engage in faith formation uh, that at least is partially not digital um, is really helpful. And then finally, just support, empower, and resource. So we give our catechist, catechist editions. I'm not suggesting that you necessarily give that to all of your parents, but making sure that they have access to the resources that are gonna make this be a good experience of having special time together with their child as a family and sharing faith. So one thing um, that I did was specific groups. So, so if you are, uh, you know, maybe the DRE takes care of all the big family stuff, but as a catechist, what can you do? It's also important to get to know your participants. So whether this is a group of families or individual grade level kind of children or your adults in your RCIA process, it's important to get to know who they are. This is actually part of the catechetical process. So again, going back to the new directory, um, in paragraph 179, it says the work of the Catechist consists in finding and drawing attention to the signs of God's action already present in the lives of persons. And by using these as an example, present the gospel as a transformative power for the whole existence. So part of catechesis is pointing to people's lives and saying, you know, that's God's action there. That's God's action. Again, this is paragraph 179 from the new directory. And then using those as examples. So it's really important that we know what's happening with people. Um, and so I gave a bunch of icebreakers and kind of get to know you activities in the webinar teaching religion online and Nancy's going to tell you at the end when we go through some of those resources how to access that. But you can find some icebreakers there. This is one I did with my ninth graders last year. We used a Google form when they checked in. So every week I just asked them what's your relationship with God like right now. Uh, and we used the storm. So it's sunny. So it was happy and exciting or it was stormy or it was rainy, which meant it was sad or foggy, which and it was a little confusing. And so this did a couple of things. Number one, it made them think about it. It made them be mindful of, oh, what, what was my relationship with God like this week? And then the other thing is it gave them a language to share that with us. So as catechists, this only went to me and my co-catechists, but it gave us an opportunity. Um, you know, so we had one kid who was sunny, 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 and all of a sudden it was stormy. And that gave us a great opportunity to just check in with him and be like, hey, what's going on? Um, and then offer him some support and some resources and pray with him about that difficult phase that he was having in his relationship with God. All right, we're going to keep going and I will get questions at the end. Okay, so what about the content? That's all the relationship stuff. What do we do with content? So bite size as a catechetical tool is about content chunking. And so it's breaking content into segments that are smaller, shorter, and easier to manage. And we do this because learning is a process of acquiring new information and connecting it to what we have already learned. And there is this theory, it was first established in 1956, like but it's still accepted today that the average person can ha have five to nine items in their short-term memory at one time. And so when you have more than that, you just can't remember it. And so we have lots of things in our short-term memory. We're learning lots of new processes now. We're trying to figure out how do you use this tool on Zoom? How do I ask the question? How do I get from Mentimeter back to my Zoom webinar? And so when we arrange content into smaller chunks that are easier to manage, we're actually making it easier to understand and easier to learn. And so there's two levels of content chunking. So the first one is the course level, which is how we organize and group information. Um, 
And if you're using a, a ever used a catechist edition, we really do this for you. We give you units, we give you chapters, we give you a course of study. But as, as a catechist, you might take that chapter or that lesson and even break it down into smaller chunks. And then the second level of content chunking is what you put on the screen. And so it's keeping in mind how much information can be consumed at one time. And you will see as I go through my slides, sometimes I'm really good. This is a great slide. It doesn't have that much information on it. It has nice big font. It has bullet points instead of complete sentences. It's broken down in a way that helps you to understand and to comprehend very quickly. Uh, this is important in a digital environment. So those of you who are viewing this on your phone or your tablet are going to see your font size smaller than those of us who are viewing from a computer. And so it's really important that we keep in mind how much is too much um, when we are presenting information. So again, it's the course level breaking down information into groups and chunks, and then also the presentation of the content. So why is this important? Zoom fatigue is a real thing. Okay, so online learning is not and should not be a one-to-one -one, uh, correlation to face-to-face -face learning. So if you have a 45-minute catechetical session, you're not necessarily going to be online doing that same session for exactly 45 minutes. So part of this is that video conferencing and even events like this are a little bit harder on our brains than face-to-face -face interactions. So all of you have your cameras off so I can't see you, but if I could see you, my brain is trying to process all of your individual faces at one time. And that's a lot of nonverbal communication to try to take in. And so ultimately, according to one study from National Geographic, we can't comprehend anything in that environment, that it's all just too much and overly. And so we also get very mindful of what our own face and our own expressions are and we start to worry about what people think about, you know, what are they seeing in our background. And so just video interactions in general, very stressful on our brains. And so when we can reduce our content into smaller essential chunks, um, we're reducing the stress on the brains of our learners, of our families, of parents. So one thing I want to add, there is no clearly ideal amount of time for a video kind of gathering like this. Um, E-learning experts suggest that for children, it probably should be somewhere between 15 and 30 minutes. Um, and that depends on age and level of engagement. So right now you're getting a lot of me talking to you and we really would want to do less of that with children and have more interactive components. All right. So here's our theological reason as to why we need to do content chunking. And again, quoting the new directory, catechesis following the example of Jesus helps to illuminate and interpret the experiences of life in the light of the gospel. If catechesis neglects to correlate human experiences with the revealed message, it falls into the danger of artificial juxtapositions or misunderstanding the truth. And so when we group content so that the idea and the application, the content and the experience are right next to each other. We actually are making it easier for learners to integrate that experience and that knowledge. And so um, God speaks into our human experience. God speaks into all of it. And so we could teach all of the content of the catechism, but if we fail to help people recognize how that connects to their lived experience or how they live their lives, they can't integrate it. And so one way to think about content chunking or bite-sized catechesis, and I'll get to why I call it bite-sized in a minute, is that when the content is brought closer to the experience, it, it makes it more concrete, more tangible, and more easily integrated into their learning experience. All right, so let's get to this bite-sized thing. I have actually, when I think about bite-sized catechesis and this chunking process, if you're familiar with the popular apps like um, Couch to 5K or Duolingo, they break big ideas down into little components that can be done in one sitting very quickly. Um, and you can either do several of them together or you can just do one and be done for the day. So this idea, this process of bite-sized catechesis, I've actually gone through it once, um, and now I'm going to explain it to you. So, so far, I have introduced to you the big idea of how do we welcome families into online environments. I gave you information for why it was important, and I gave you a task to integrate it into your own planning. And you will evaluate that on your own, I am sure. So again, this is the process. Start with one big idea or question. What is the essential concept? 
It should be meaningful to people though. So if they has, if it has no meaning for their lives, again, it's hard for them to integrate it to the knowledge that they already have. So one big question. Then you give them information for inquiry. What do they need to know to explore this? And this really should be just a few sentences. What are the essential things for them to know to begin the following task? You can filter out the non-essential stuff. They might come up to a point where they need more information, but it's a more organic learning style if they're like, oh, well, I need to learn this now because I'm exploring whatever your big question is. And then you give them the task. Modern learners want to use information right away. And by modern learners, I don't just mean children. I mean people who are living in our modern environment. Um, so it has the internet, the digital culture has kind of, it's made us expect immediacy. And we have to be careful with that because it can get uh, disordered. But we also have the opportunity to give them an application right away. And so the more creative and interactive that this can be, the better um, that you're really trying to give them an experience or tap into an experience that they've already had that uses this information to explore that big idea. I'm going to give you a bunch of examples in just a minute. And then that fourth step is that you either expand or you evaluate. And so what did they learn? What was their experience like? And where do we go next? It's important to remember before we jump into all of the examples of what this means, that at the center of every catechetical process is an encounter with Christ. And so when you jump into this, this is what you should be thinking with, is how does this provide the possibility of encountering Christ? So how does this give them an experience that may lead to that encounter? So it's not watering down the faith. It's not, you know, cutting out lots of content. It's just a different approach to it. So it's arranging content to be in conversation with their own learners experience. All right, let's do a couple of examples. So this first example is if you are doing, so first of all, I made up this website. This does not exist in real life. It's just an example. Um, so if you are doing whole family faith formation and maybe you're getting small groups of two or three families together um, to do online formation. So it's all kids and adults at one time. Maybe this would be how you would present their first module, their first chunk. So in this first slide, the big idea is what is prayer? We're hoping that families will establish a, a habit of prayer within their own households. And so this is your first piece of information. And then you'll see right under what is prayer. It's the quote from the catechism that says prayer is raising of one's mind and heart to God or of requesting good things from God. And I included a link there um, into a, a, the catechism online so that if they wanted to look more into it, they could, but we're just keeping it really basic here. Um, so this is like, I made it up as a mock website. You might use this. It could be an email. Um, it could be part of your parish website. It could be if you have a learning management system. This looks maybe a little bit fancy for some of you. It's really just built using tables in Word. So you just design the table and put the content where you want it and then turn off the lines so that they can't see the content. So again, big idea is what is prayer. And the information is prayers raising one's hearts and minds uh, to God. And so in this little section on the side, family one tasks modules. So you'll see that I used a numbered list. They know one, two, three, this is what they have to do to complete this module. The first thing that they need to do, ask them to, as a family, define prayer. So in this way, and I asked them to share it, and I'm using an app called Padlet for this, and I'm going to show you Padlet in, a, in my next example, um, but I'm asking them to share their family's definition. So in this way, they're actually even providing information for others and that they can respond to it. Um, Padlet has an opportunity for you to filter responses, so if you wanted to make sure that families were not giving like really wild definitions, you could actually look um, before it posted and other people could respond to it. So their second thing is to choose their task to complete. And I'm going to show you your tasks in just a minute. Um, they're actually right below this cut. And their third part is to join the family video chat. So this would be the E part of Byte. So they're going to expand or evaluate. They're going to talk about what was their experience. And they're also going to talk about what, do they, what would they like to explore as a family next based on their experience of prayer. So it gives them an opportunity to say, you know, we did this prayer with an art project and it was a disaster. It doesn't work 
work with our kids. Um, or they could come back and say, you know, we really loved going on a nature hike as part of prayer and we'd like to do some more of that. You will also notice that I have linked all of the things right here. So it has the link to their family video chat. Uh, if you're linking to video sessions, you don't, you want to make sure you're either password protected or that you have a waiting room enabled that way you're only allowing in the people you expect. Um, but they don't have to go look everywhere else. It's all in one place. This is part of that communication. So these are their family prayer tasks. And so I gave them four choices. This font is a little bit small for you. So the first choice is using our family gathers, um, watching a video to create a family prayer space. So it talks about how do you set up a prayer space and they're actually going to do it. So that's one option. Um, watching the video would be online, but creating prayer space is a non-digital option. Their second choice is using our family devotions to explore a popular devotion that maybe has something to do with their family or their culture. Again, Again, using a printed resource to um, explore prayer within their own families. This is a great option for families that already have a prayer habit. You're giving them something new to try. Uh, maybe they're going to use Catholic prayers and practices to explore an online prayer space that I'm going to show you in just a minute. Or their fourth choice is to create a playlist of songs that help you pray. So again, four choices that families can do. Um, it gives them all of their instructions right there, and you're just asking them to explore one to say, how does this help me raise my heart and my mind to God or to ask God for good things and to explore it as a family. So it's all going back to that one focused task. And depending on which one they choose, the longest amount of time that they're necessarily spending online is your family video chat. And so you're, you're giving them one task, limiting how much time they have to be online and providing opportunities for all of them to interact. So this is my digital prayer space. So some teachers are using things like this to create virtual classrooms. Um, and I use this to, to give a space that if you were in a physical classroom, so if you're doing a graded level, you might wanna have one of these prayer spaces as well. And so these different boxes link to different aspects of um, prayer experiences. So the Bible links to the USCCB reading site and the Mary links to um, Hail Mary in various languages. And then this one, I'm gonna show you this one. This one goes to Padlet. And Padlet is like an online bulletin board that you can post the question and then people can respond, but they can respond in text, an image by drawing, a video recording or an audio recording. So it gives them lots of options to post. And again, they can either post anonymously or you can facilitate um, that. And so again, just gives them these really rich opportunities to uh, to, to share their experience of faith that you can make this an online community right there. Go back to my slide here. So how do you create these? Because people ask me this question all the time. It's actually just built in PowerPoint and you search on the internet for um, free to reuse images that have a transparent background. Uh, you build your room. I prefer to actually save it and then use it as the background on my slide and then just add hyperlinks to it. So you could use this again if you have a gathered session. You might use your families that are doing lectionary based catechesis. They might play, you know, in here that this links them to the lectionary reading. We have um, a great ritual for families and praying the scriptures. It's called Sunday celebrations. Uh, you can do this in various languages. So again, it's just creating an online space that houses your links that has some visual interest. All right, so let's, um, I'm taking too long here. So let's jump into um, just one more example of using this in a traditional classroom. So again, this is seventh grade. So pretend this is a traditional grade level. Your seventh graders are all meeting with their catechist. Um, so their big idea, chapter one in Blessed Are We Faith in Action is that God loves us so much he sent his son to save us. I took that directly from the at a glance planner. It is the faith focus on that page. The information that I would give them comes from the Hear and Believe pages, or if you're using Be My Disciples, it would be the Discover pages. And I use the faith words. So what is the incarnation? And I would give them this either by a video or maybe we would chat in our online session. And then I'm a big fan of choice. Um, we know that our learners, when they are allowed to have choice and voice and how they learn things and how they show us that they know it, that they um, 
that they do better in learning. And so this, you know, hopefully spurs some curiosity, makes them want to learn some things. So this particular board gives them four options. One of them is to share a photo of their family's nativity set and describe how their own family traditions celebrate God's love for humanity. The second one is to read the infancy narrative from Luke or from Matthew and send in those words using that same process we used at the beginning that stand out and then compare and contrast the two versions. This whole activity comes out of the activities and projects section um, or the activities and projects ancillary that is part of Bless Your We Faith in Action. So if you have access to that ebook through Flourish, so Flourish is our digital platform where we house all of our digital resources that are related to our products from RCL Benziger. If you have access to that ebook, uh, you can grab that PDF and then either send it out to families or if you're using a learning management system. Um, option three is to take a virtual tour of the church and the nativity. Now I had to go look for this one myself, but we do actually have virtual tours um, that are linked to some of the activities in Flourish. So there's a lot of tools in Flourish that are useful for this. And then number four is free choice. So this is their task is to choose one of these and they're using chapter one as a guide. So if you look at the top of that slide, I told them this is where you get more information if you need more information. And then as an evaluation, you know, some of you might need a more formal assessment that goes with that chapter but you could also just look at how did they respond what was their reflection how did they really integrate this knowledge of the mystery of god became man into their life and one last example is you know let's say we are using this grade level um, catechesis but we're having parents do it at home so these are not kids who are necessarily meeting with a catechist so they would also go, could go to Flourish. Um, you know, if we're giving parents the textbook, the at-home guide is a, for Be My Disciples or the Family Resource for Bluster We Faith in Action is a great resource for families to kind of move through some of these lessons. But we need to remember there's a ton of stuff available for them to also use on Flourish. So maybe in this one we say, the big idea, this is for chapter 13, which is about the mass. And the big idea is that the introductory rites gather us at mass as disciples of Jesus. And so maybe we ask them to use the chapter activity in pages 122 and 123 from the student's book to learn, well, what does it mean, the introductory rites? So their big idea is the introductory rites, their information, they're gonna use this activity, and then they're going to end the pages from their book. And then their task is to participate in the mass, either by live stream or in person, because we don't want our families to be disconnected from our faith communities. So this task does the dual purpose of giving children an experience of the introductory rights, but also keeping them connected to our community. And they could use, this is actually our brand new My Mass book. This is a page from the Mass book that they could use to follow along and that we direct them to pay attention to the introductory rights. And then um, to complete this example, again, their, their activity here. Now this one I made using my own church because again, I want to keep them connected to my community. So let's hope it pops up here correctly. Um, they would do this drag and drop activity that I created. This is, this is actually my parish. Um, and they would take these words and pull them over to the appropriate place. And then they could send me that, their, that assignment. So it's a combination of the resources that we have available from RCL Benziger for families to really just focus on that introductory right. And then we can connect them to your own parish by creating those pieces that really personalize that learning experience for children. So again, the idea is that you're going through the big idea, the information for inquiry, some sort of task that gives them an experience of it, and then you're going to expand from there. And so a couple of things for our catechists to keep in mind here. Whoops, I went to the wrong slide. This is what happens when I'm jumping around here. All right, so tips for our catechists. So first of all, just pray. And I don't say that flippantly, we just need to remember that God is with us in this moment. Um, to be in community, there are an amazing group of educators who are all trying really hard to learn new ways of learning. And it's good for us to struggle with learning. It helps us to remember that experience of what our children and our families are going through. Um, but maybe, maybe you have somebody in your parish who's not particularly into, like they're not feeling called as a catechist, but they have some amazing technical skills. And maybe they would be a resource and be willing 
going to do um, some tutorials or some best practices. Know your platform. So there, I showed you probably five different resources that are available out there. Um, I, know what your tools are that are available to you, know the basic functions of them, and know how they work. And again, don't keep it simple. Like maybe start with one thing and then one little addition that just makes you super happy. Um, so for me, I love the little online digital virtual prayer space with my little cartoon version of myself in it. Um, but that's, that might be beyond your skill level and that's okay because you just need to show them that you've experienced the love of God and that you want them to experience it too. If you are a DRE, please host practice sessions for your catechists. Let them get comfortable with the tools. And the other thing is be flexible and be patient. As you're learning these new tools and these new ways of learning, you might find that something that you thought was gonna be fabulous just doesn't work. And so, so be flexible, be patient with yourself, be patient with your families as they're finding these things. Get comfortable praying online. Um, so even for people who are very comfortable praying in front of others, it's different and prioritize those relationships. So remember what we're about is helping children and families to grow in their relationship with God and with their community in the church. And so we can give them all the content in the world, but if we make them miserable in the process, they won't integrate it. It won't ring authentic in their lives. So prioritize those relationships. And just remember, you are beloved by God. Take a deep breath. I gave you a ton of information. It's overwhelming. Say a prayer and know you can do this because I believe in you. And more importantly, God is with you in all of this. And I know there's a ton of questions because I've been ignoring that chat box. So I'm going to let Nancy, I think Nancy's coming back here now. I'm coming back. Um, yes, one of the, the biggest questions that we need to ask and answer, and you can answer after my very brief word from the sponsor, but everyone loves the drop and drag for your church. So we want to make sure that we um, address that question as soon as I can briefly get through and share with you some of the resources RCL Benziger has to offer. So if you would go to the next slide, Amy, please. All right, great. So hopefully you're aware of the many resources RCL Benziger has to to offer and they all have a digital component so we hope that you'll be able to reach out to your local sales representative and find out more about all of our digital resources that will help you transition into this new way of faith formation next one miss amy If you have some young learners, some little preschoolers, and you're looking for some tips and ideas to help families uh, during uh, the formation at home, please check out Miss Debbie's tips on YouTube, and there will be a plethora of videos that will really support uh, early childhood education and the catechists that are, and families that are working with those young ones. And a special site I want to invite you to go to uh, is called uh, Free Catholic Resources. And there we have Saint Resources, Catholic Parenting 101, Family Prayers, Laudato C activities. If you're looking for some really hands-on ways that the families can do those nature walks and, and find that um, extend or the task of the bite, uh, great resources there. And also know that we have a, a wide variety of previous webinars that you can feel free they're they're there on that website and uh, Amy did one a couple weeks ago mm -hmm. on uh, faith formation in the schools online so check those out And uh, another new website that Amy has, uh, has really done a great job with is our Family Faith Resources for Family Catechesis. So again, check that out and it's going to continue to grow with resources that will really support you in how do we look to uh, faith formation and that engagement with the families and really helping them uh, in a hybrid model or however home-based catechesis. So it's gonna help you with a lot of those ideas so you can continue continue to share faith at home, online, however. So next one, Miss Amy. 
Um, and if you're looking for some support or resources for lectionary based catechesis or how to engage the families with the Sunday readings, uh, we do have a brand new praying the scriptures that is a lectionary based approach. It does have faith formation sessions for primary, intermediate, and junior high. And I think one of the greatest little, and Amy may say something later, but the Sunday celebrations. So a wonderful tool that families could break open the Sunday readings in a little liturgy of the word for children format but again if they're live streaming or going to mass uh, excellent tool that possibly would be a faith formation guided throughout the week not just a 45 minute time frame but just some questions to reflect on and break open that eucharistic celebration And I'm almost done, so I know you want to get to uh, Amy's question or questions for Amy. Another option we have for you is our family gathers, and these are five seasonal sessions that accompany the liturgical year. Again, intentions for gathering people together in the same space, but easily adaptable if you're looking for a once a month gathering uh, of families uh, in a small group setting or even on a Zoom kind of a date night. There's wonderful resources in this, both in digital and in print. I think I'm up to the last one, I think we'll put up. Oh, and Amy, will, she showed some of these uh, resources available to you. Our Family Faith is a resource guide for family catechesis. Amy mentioned our family devotions, 39 uh, devotions from around the globe that really could uh, um, have families be able to investigate the how we are as a global church and how we celebrate those traditions throughout the world. And we have prayer books, our family praise, and our Catholic prayers and practices. But I know they're anxious to get to the questions, Amy, so if you wouldn't mind putting up that last slide. If you are interested in any samples, um, and you'd like to know who your local representative is, if you have more questions, uh, our vice president and general manager, Jeff, is willing to take that on. So there is his email address. Now, Amy, a couple questions that popped up is what are some of the non... Oh, wait, I asked you a question earlier and we must uh, answer the drop and drag. All right, I'm going to go back to that slide for just a minute so that you all can see it again. Um, and then I'll come back to this one so they can get that great contact information. So going to... Oh, I hid that slide. Never mind. We're going to stay on this one. Anyway, so the way that you do a drop and drag activity. So I took that picture of my church. Um, it is actually the, the interior of my church. And I uploaded it to my computer and I saved it as the background on the slide. So whether you're working in Google Slides or if you're working in PowerPoint, if you format background and you use the picture to format the background, it puts it in the background and then they can't move the picture of the church. And then you just create the text text boxes that you want them to move around. And so they actually are interact and you can lock the text boxes as well. So you can save them as an image so that they can move them but not delete them or resize them. And then they move them around in, um, in the build mode. So if you're using Google Slides or PowerPoint or any of those kind of software things, you would do that in build mode where they would move them there and then they could just um, download that, that file or in PowerPoint you save as show is how you get it to um, not move once they email it to you and then they could just email you that file to show you that they have put them in the correct places. But again, the key is to use that image as the background of the slide. So format background and put in the image and then make your text boxes and then they can just drag them around and not move the picture of the church while they do it. So that's the drag and drop activity. I'm sorry, your next question was? Oh, I got excited. The next question is, uh, what are some non-digital options? So non-digital options can be lots of things. So if you think about the things that families have in their house that can create, um, that they can use to create activities. So um, very standard things could be have them to draw a picture of a story if you have little kids. So draw a picture to understand it. Um, you might encourage a family to go on a hike. Uh, you might have them practice um, 
you know, uh, using the vessels at their own house. Now you have to be really clear about what is a sacred vessel and what is not, but you know, how are they using the vessels to learn how to hold the chalice or to how to receive from the plate? Uh, you know, that there's that connection between our dining table and our altar table, but again, making a clear distinction about which is which. Um, so using those, those items that they have there, using Legos to build the kingdom of God, what's the kingdom of God look like? And so sometimes you can take those, those activities um, that are just non-digital options. So drawing, listening to music, an experience of prayer, praying the rosary, um, you know, anything that they can do that, that doesn't require them to be on the internet is, is a great non-digital option. Um, and, and sometimes it's, it's, you know, writing. Some kids like to write. It's okay to ask kids to write. You just don't want to do it all the time. Oh, great. I am answering some questions on the Q&A, so watch for that too. There was a question about what is the recommended number of participants recommended for a Zoom class? Probably like what's the most we should expect um, in uh, children or adults that would be on a Zoom classroom setting? Sure. So the great way to approach that is what is a reasonable conversation? Um, Zoom has a feature that you can use breakout rooms and, and Google Meet I think is adding breakout rooms if they don't have them already. So, but if you're going to do that with children, you need to have a second adult, um, even if they're just listening in on what's happening in that other breakout room. So I would say, uh, you know, probably you want to look at, it's going to depend on the kids because some kids just don't want to talk, but you know, depending on the kids, you probably want to have maybe 10 or fewer if you want to have really good conversation. Um, if you have designated like these five people are sharing today. So if you if you limit the number of people who are sharing each time and you take turns on that and you have other ways of interacting, you can get by with slightly higher numbers than that. But again, um, the measure is how many are enough to have really good communication. And that varies by age and again, interactivity. Great. Now, thank you, Amy. Um, let me see. And Anne, if you can see any other questions, how did you create your learning space with your links to readings and prayers? I think that was your uh, pretend website. Um, I used a pretend website. I think they mean the, the one where my little cartoon character is in it. So again, it's built in either Google Slides or PowerPoint, and you can do an internet search for um, like one of mine was wooden floor. <laughs> and then you click on free to reuse because that's how we honor copyright and people's uh, intellectual property. And then you give it a transparent background. And so you can just use those and pull those images in and drop them into the space. Again, I like to download that as a, either a PNG or a JPEG file, so a photo file, and then upload it again as the background so that the pieces don't move and then add the links on top of this. And um, you know, if you, if, you, if you want more specific instructions, if you even email Nancy, she'll forward it to me, and then I will give you more specific instructions that go with that. I do see one question over in the questions that I want to answer very quickly, and it's a question about how to connect your current Be My Disciples or Blessed Are We Faith in Action to the digital format. Um, and so Flourish is the access site for that. And so Flourish is where our eBooks are housed. It's where we have PDFs of activities. Um, we have great training videos on there at the catechist level. We we have uh, lectionary resources. So both of our basal series are actually correlated to, to the readings where you can say, this is the reading this week and this is the chapter that goes with that thematic content. All of that is housed on Flourish. Um, and if you're not familiar with Flourish, contact your sales rep because they can really help you to, to work through um, where those pieces are. So, so it's not necessarily connecting you know, your paper book into a digital book. You have uh, those resources available to you um, to various configurations of what's available on Flourish. Great. Um, any tips for a Zoom meeting involving a small group of families, three to four? So small group of families, um, a couple of things to keep in mind. Number one, do they know each other? And number two, um, are they in similar situations? So the number of people that you're putting on a Zoom call, if you have one camera and they have five people gathered around it, people will be going in and out of your vision. They'll be talking over one another. Um, so again, those establishing the relationships, so set expectations. If you expect every member of the family to be present, you need to say so in the front end so that they can 
plan accordingly. Um, if you want if you want them to have an answer ready for some activity. So making sure you give them think time or advance notice if they have to present something to one another. Um, and then again, building those relationships and giving them opportunities to get to know one another and one another's spaces. One of the things I do want us to be mindful of in terms of pastoral concerns when we're using video chat is that in a lot of ways, the digital environment has given us an opportunity to move faith formation into our homes, which is awesome in so many ways. But part of that is we're inviting ourselves into people's homes. And so I don't know about you all, but I have some people that are my very close friends who can come over because they've already seen my mess. And I have other people that I'm shoving lots of things behind a closed door before I let them into my house. And so it's important that, that when we think about those considerations that sometimes children or adults or families want to turn off their video to hide their chaos, or they want to use a virtual background to, to cover up that they have a mess of dishes behind them because they just finished dinner. So when you're thinking about how you're engaging families, like we want to see faces, that's really important. Um, but we also want to honor what's happening in homes and making sure that we're respectful of that. So again, um, establish expectations on the front end. Don't be afraid to mute people if their family is getting too loud and you need to mute them. It's okay. They won't be offended. They know they're loud. Um, and then again, being respectful of the fact that you are inviting other families into a family's home. Great. And one final word, uh, well, two final words. Uh, you are more than, it's acceptable and please do when you receive the recording as well as the PDF of Amy's PowerPoint presentation, please feel free to share with your catechist, mm -hmm. with uh, friends and family. Uh, please know that you have that right to share that. And also, Amy, the final question was um, a list or a naming again of all of the various uh, platforms that you mentioned. You think you can do that oh, at our final? <laughs> um, so first of all, some of these will be live links when you receive the PDF. So you can click on them and look at it if I miss one. So Mentimeter is the one that I used at the beginning that has polling features that perform that make word clouds. They also have other polling options, but, but word clouds, that's Mentimeter. Um, I used Padlet, which is the online bulletin board. Uh, I talked, I think I mentioned Flipgrid, if I didn't. Flipgrid is, it's video recording. So you can put up a question and then they can record their video response to it. Um, I talked about either Google Slides or, or PowerPoint, um, which are, are related. Uh, they're similar, they're just one's cloud-based and one's not. Um, I think that's it, but feel free to click on my links if I forgot one, sorry about that. The USCCB website, and then of course Flourish, our digital platform is the other one that I mentioned. Great, and finally, thank you for spending time with us. Please know that you will receive again the recording link as well as the PDF. In the meantime, you might get a thank you for attending the webinar, and my email address is at the bottom of that. So if you do come up with any additional questions, or you need some support or help in finding your local sales representative, just send me an email and I'll be happy to forward the question to Amy and any information on to your local um, support person. So I think uh, time, we're over time, but we do appreciate everyone being with us today. God bless you all in this crazy time. And uh, thank you for looking to RCL Benziger for your support uh, during this uh, interesting and wonderful opportunity to share the love of Jesus Christ with all of those children and families entrusted to your care. So God bless you all. And until next time, uh, we'll see you. Bye. God bless. Thank you.